Hi and welcome to this first session on the Sermon on the Mount looking at the Beatitudes. Now I think the Beatitudes are probably one of Jesus's most misunderstood teachings. You know they're quite well known but I think for that reason they are quite misunderstood. You know for example people think about blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted and think ah well that's nice isn't it because Jesus is talking about people who have been bereaved and people who are mourning for, for other reasons and it's just a comforting and nice thing for them to hear isn't it that's what it's all about. I remember a few years ago I was reading an article and uh, this particular person was trying to make the case that the the Beatitudes were in some way kind of in competition with the Ten Commandments you know that there were different kind of Christians you know you could either be a Ten Commandments Christian which is really kind of harsh and and rule bound and you know strict or you could be a Beatitudes kind of Christian and you could be kind of soft and gentle and loving and forgiving and, and all of those all of those kind of things I think that that attitude is alive and well in the church today but actually I don't think that really pays close enough attention to what Jesus actually said. I think that's why we need to, to think carefully about what Jesus did actually say and in particular how it relates to the Ten Commandments, how it relates to the Old Testament because that was, as we've seen I mentioned in the, the introduction that the, the Ten Commandments and the Beatitudes are often linked and or the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount and, and that's true there is a link uh, between them and we will kind of see more of that coming as we go through these next few uh, few chapters. But for now let's just look at what Jesus did actually say and what I want to say at, at the beginning is that this is the Beatitudes are a what John Stock calls a manifesto for the Christian life. You now they are how Jesus kind of summarizes in a nutshell what the, the Christian life is all about. Now this is what every Christian life should be like. And Jesus uh, uses, he prefaces each statement with blessed are, blessed are. And um, I think it's important to say that this doesn't mean that if you want to get blessing from God you need to do these things but rather that if you do these things that is in itself showing that you are blessed by God so it's not doing looking at the list and thinking oh I need to do this in order to be blessed by God but rather if we do this it shows that we are already blessed by God you know this is in a sense a response to to being blessed by God because it shows that we are living in the way that God wants us to live. And that's another important point, by the way, that blessing, when Jesus says blessed, and sometimes people think blessing means happy, but actually blessing means living within the will and the, the favour of God, living in the way that God wants us to live. And that means that it's not kind of a, uh, it, it can be there even when you're going through a tough time. You know, you can still be blessed by God even when people persecute you because you're living within the favour and within the will of God. And God is kind of there in that, even if it's not the happiest of times for you in, a, in an earthly sense, in a worldly sense. So with that said, let's dive in. I'm just going to talk briefly about each of the things that Jesus says and try and explain how this relates to the Christian life. So Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does poor in spirit mean? Being spiritually poor. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, about materially poor. Now, I, I work with people who are from a, all kind of walks of life, some of which are, are wealthy, some of whom are poor. And really, I can tell you there is no inherent Kind of virtue in being materially poor. No, it's not not saying that materially poor people are more more blessed, but rather being spiritually poor is the key. That is in recognizing that we have nothing that we can bring to plead our case before God. Now we have nothing that we can bring that will earn us righteousness or, or anything from God that will earn us any favor. And that's the the classic teaching that they. Uh, sort of rediscovered at the Reformation, justification by faith alone, 
that actually we are justified only by virtue of faith in God through Christ, through his death on the cross, not through any good thing that we do. You know, we've got no good works, nothing that we can plead to, that, that would make God consider us righteous, that would make God more inclined to answer our prayers or more inclined to show favour to us. We are all spiritually poor and we Christians need to come to God recognising our spiritual poverty. There's a parable in Luke that uh, Jesus tells that talks about this, which is the parable of the uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector, and that's in uh, Luke chapter 18. Uh, if you want to have a look, Luke chapter 18, verses um, 9, to, uh, 9 to 14. But the contrast between those two people, the Pharisee who looked down on the tax collector, and he says, you know, uh, Lord, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers or, or adulterers, or even like this tax collector. You know, he's trusting in his own righteousness. But the tax collector stood at a distance, doesn't even look up to heaven, but he beats his breast and says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man rather than the other went home justified before God. And that, I think, is a picture of what Jesus means here about being ble blessing, being the poor in spirit, in recognising our spiritual poverty. That is blessing because we know that we can't do anything. But actually, it is only recognising our spiritual poverty that we are able to be inheritors of the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus uh, goes on to say. So then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, this is a verse which is often used around the time of funerals, around, um, you know, people who are who are grieving. And I think it's, it's a lovely verse, but I don't think it means mourning in the sense of kind of a you just had a bereavement sort of mourning. Now, I think it's talking more about the kind of prophetic mourning that the, the prophets called for in the Old Testament over sin. And that's what the, uh, for example, the prophet Joel calls people. He says, you know, look, look at all of these things that have come upon you. If you repent, if you, you weep, you wail, you grieve over your sin, then God will, will relent and, and forgive you if you repent. And, that, and, and, and sort of grieving and mourning over sin is part of that. I think about you know, recently in our, in our church, we preached through the book of Jonah and uh, I was struck when we looked at Jonah chapter 3 about how Nineveh, they repented, but they did that by kind of putting on sackcloth and um, declaring a fast and it's that kind of mourning over their sin and their wickedness. And that, I think, is the kind of mourning which Jesus is talking about here. Not a general sort of mourning, but actually a mourning over our own, our own sin, our own wickedness, our own evil. And actually then we can be comforted because when we mourn over our own sin, we know that we have a saviour in Jesus who died for, to, to save us from our sins, who sets us free from our sins. So I think that's how, how that, that works. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now my wife has a, a joke that she likes about this. Uh, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, if that's all right with everyone else. And uh, I quite like that as well. But uh, I think it's important to remember that meekness is sort of a, and gentleness is a Christian, is a Christian characteristic which Jesus had. You know, Jesus was, was meek, wasn't he? He wasn't trying to assert himself. He didn't come to, to kind of just lay down all of his power and authority. Now, I was struck by this in our home group yesterday. Um, there's a, we were, we've been going through Luke. And in Luke chapter four, there's a point in Jesus when Jesus begins his ministry, when uh, he basically speaks against the people in Capernaum, and the people take him out and they want to, to stone him, and Jesus slips out through the crowds, and they couldn't do it. And it just struck me, you know, how willingly Jesus went to his own death. Jesus didn't have to to die in the sense that you know he could have just avoided it if he wanted to. He willingly went to his own death. He meekly submitted to the Father. He meekly submitted even to evil uh, human beings for the, the purposes of, of good, the good 
uh, that he was going to do on the cross. And I think that kind of meekness, that submission to God uh, and not trying to assert ourselves, but trying to to do God's will. And to there's a lovely verse in uh, Philippians, you know, in humility, put others above yourself, consider others above yourself. And I think that's lovely, you know, that kind of the meekness in in thinking of others rather than trying to put ourselves first all the time. And that Jesus was the prime example of that, is that they will inherit the earth. Now, we don't have to try and win everything by asserting ourselves and getting everything, that we can be meek and, and just receive from God rather than trying to gain it all for ourselves. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Again, talking about that, the righteousness, the righteousness that comes through knowing God. Now, it's it's one of those things, actually, that the more and the longer I see in the Christian life, the more I see the truth in this, that the, the longer I, I go on as a Christian, the more I see, actually, that I'm a I'm a sinful man and that I see that more as time goes on. I actually see myself as worse in a sense now than I did a few years ago. But at the same time, I can see more of the grace of God in what he has done with me and kind of used me in spite of myself. And I can see the truth in this, that you know I recognise that it's about hungering and thirsting for righteousness, knowing that we are dry, we are empty, but that we need to look to God and his righteousness every day. But as we do that, then we will be filled. You know, it's as we recognise our own spiritual poverty and our need for the righteousness and the help of God and his spirit, that we will be filled. And I think that's such a wonderful promise because, you know, so many things we we think, oh, I'm un- I'm insufficient to do this. I can't do this on my own. But actually, if we hunger and thirst for God's help in doing that and God's righteousness and so on in doing that, then we will be filled. Then he will help us. I think this is why God often places us in situations which we're unable to do ourselves, because actually it causes us to, to do just this. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, I often think of the parable of the unmerciful servant and how the, uh, the servant who was forgiven a huge amount by the king then goes and uh, demands a small amount from one of his fellow servants. And the king hears about this and throws the unmerciful servant into prison. And Jesus says, it will be like this with you unless you forgive from your heart. And I think it's that thing, isn't it, that when we have received the mercy of God, then we we will show mercy because we have to, because all of the things that we've been forgiven by, uh, by God, all of those things are, are just so much more than anything that anyone else has done to us. You know, the things that God has forgiven me are so much more than anything anyone could ever do to me. And that's the thing, that when we have received mercy, then we give that same mercy to others. And and Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You know, we we understand what mercy is when we've been when we've been shown it and we give that to others. And I think of that line in the Lord's Prayer, you know, forgive us our sins as we forgive. And just thinking you know, that, that that tying together of how we have been treated by God and how we treat others is, is so important. You know, that the gospel needs to change how we relate to other people. And uh, we relate to people as forgiven sinners. And we should extend that same grace that God has extended to us, to others. It's a, a really hard thing to do, but the gospel gives us that strength uh, to do it. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. There's a line in Hebrews which says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's almost the same as this verse, actually, just a slightly different phrasing. But I, I think it's, it's true, isn't it, that our sinfulness hides God from us. No, we can't see God as sinners. And when we think about what Jesus came to do, yes, he came to, to purify us, 
to, to make it possible for us to come to God. But I do think, you know, obviously when a, when a sinner comes and repents of sin and turns to, turns to Christ, then they're completely forgiven. They are, you know, their clothes are washed, they're clothed in the righteousness of Christ and they have access to God. But I mean, my experience has been that actually as I've grown as a Christian and as I've, I guess I've sort of my relationship with God has deepened and I've seen more of my own sin and more of Christ in that, that actually I do feel like I see more of God now than I did. And that's a hard thing to kind of to quantify, I know, but I can see the truth in this. That as God changes us, I think we grow in our relationship with him and we grow to love him more. And and actually our sin does put a barrier up between us and God. And Christ destroys that barrier. He's done it once for all at the cross. But I think he does that every day as we come to God, as we repent of our sin, as we turn to him. Uh, And every day, perhaps a little bit of our sin gets chipped off a little bit more, perhaps. And, and, uh, you know, we turn to Christ a bit more. And uh, I don't know if that's a very helpful way of putting it, but you just talk about sanctification, you know, becoming more like Christ. As that happens, then we see God a little more. And, and certainly I, I think I can see the truth in that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. I think it's, it's funny that, that Jesus mentions, well, not funny, but, you know, um, it's interesting that Jesus talks about the children of God. Because he, the Son of God, came to make peace between us and God. He came to reconcile us uh, with God. And as we too are adopted into God's family, we too should bear the image of the peacemaker, the one like Jesus who, who made peace. And I think that means particularly proclaiming the gospel, you know, proclaiming the gospel of peace, telling people about the peace that they can have with God, uh, but also showing peace with each other you know that the gospel means that we should christians should be reconciled with each other because we are saved by the same savior and there shouldn't be war and conflict between us it doesn't mean there should be no differences between us or even um, no differences of opinion but but there should be a, a kind of unity in christ between christians because we have been saved by the same saviour and we should be able to relativise our differences and the conflicts that we have, saying, well, at least we are children of the same heavenly father. And uh, and that's what it means to, to be a peacemaker. And then Jesus, he closes out by saying, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I'm just gonna deal with the last bit as well because he sort of expands on that in these last couple of verses. It says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So what he's saying is that the Christian life is not an easy life. It's actually a life of of persecution. Now, of course, for many Christians who live in, in Western countries, then the, the Christian life is not facing death every day as it is in, in some countries. But rather, there is persecution in, in even in small things, you know, like, for example, people not wanting to be a friend because they find out that you're a Christian, work colleagues kind of shunning you maybe, or the media having making fun at your expense. And certainly in the UK, at least, I know things are getting worse in that respect and it's very difficult to be a christian now i do i do worry about our teenagers because they're growing up in a society where it's much more difficult to be a christian i think than even it was when i was a teenager that it's very difficult to to follow christ and to 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 be a follower of christ because people don't like it people don't like what jesus had to say about all sorts of different things about marriage uh, about the usage of money and possessions uh, about um, all sorts of things. You know, people don't like what Jesus had to say, but actually that is the Christian life. And Jesus says, when we stand up for him, when we stand up for what is right, you know, when we put these kind of things into practice and, and we stand up for him in public and we say, this is my faith, this is what I believe, then actually we are blessed. 
because we are within the will of God. We are doing what God wants us to do. And we are standing up for the truth, standing up for Jesus. And he will bless us and he is with us even when we do that. I think these are wonderful words because you know, I've been called some pretty horrible things by people. You know, I know something of what it is like to to stand up for Jesus and to have people calling you names and to uh, have people calling you evil and a horrible man and all sorts of things. But actually that is what we are to expect because Jesus says that is what we are to expect. And he says even you are blessed when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of false evil things about you because of me, because that is just how they treated the prophets. That's how they treated all of God's people in the Old Testament. That's how even they treated Jesus. Now, and Jesus said elsewhere, you know, a servant is not above his master. And Martin Luther said, you know, they gave my master a crown of thorns. Why should I expect a bed of roses? I think it's good, isn't it, to, to finish this section by, by thinking, what is the Christian life all about? Laying down our own lives, laying down our sin, repenting of our sin, turning to Christ, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, becoming like him, uh, making peace, proclaiming peace, and, and being prepared to stand up for the truth, even when it hurts, even when it is unpopular, standing up to do what is right. That's what a, being a Christian is all about. And I think that's a wonderful uh, summary of the Christian life. And that's what Jesus is going to unpack more over the next uh, few few chapters, next, next couple of chapters as we look through and we'll see more of that as we go. So I hope that this has sort of been a useful, there's obviously so much more you could say about the Beatitudes, but I hope that this has been a useful way in. If there are particular questions that you have which you would like me to talk about, then please do comment below. Please do uh, let me know and we can uh, talk about it in the comments. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Please do like this video and please do subscribe, especially um, if you want to see uh, future videos like this. If you hit the um, alarm button, you'll get uh, notifications when I upload these videos. Uh, and please do check out the rest of my channel. I'm doing a series on the, the Catechism, New City Catechism as well, which is sort of an overview of the Christian faith. And, and if you like this, uh, you might like that as well. So thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you again for another video very soon. Thank you and God bless.